thank you for coming to the Italian Culture Institute. I'm Lina Panetta, and I'm director here for the past four months, for those who haven't met me yet. And uh, tonight I'm really happy to welcome Diego Marani. And I must say, as first thing, I wish to thank Alitra and uh, Text Publishing for letting us know that um, uh, Diego Marani would have been in Australia. He, uh, he was in Sydney, I believe until yesterday, he was in Sydney, for the um, uh, Sydney Fest Writers Festival. Studying languages, teaching languages, translating languages. I believe that tonight here there are many people who share this passion. And uh, Diego Marani has written extensively about it. And uh, very soon he will be interviewed by Bridget Ma from Alitra, the Australian Association for Literary Translation. And uh, it will be possible to ask some questions after the talk. And um, I would also like to invite you for a glass of wine later on and some nibblings, uh, kindly offered by our sponsor, Bond Food, and um, our supporter, Brunetti, from uh, Ligon Street. Um, Something else I want to uh, point out to you is that you have found some uh, flyers on the chairs and it's about our events later on in June. So uh, for those who are not members of the Italian Culture Institute, please come back whenever you find something interesting and uh, also have a look at our website and there are many uh, new events and um, especially also our language courses. So it's um, next time that uh, Diego Marani comes back to Australia. It would be lovely that he, he could also speak in Italian to such a big crowd. Um, thank you, and I'll try also, if I'll see if um, somebody will understand um, what I had to write down in uh, Europanto. Grazie e bienvenido che Italico Institute to Parliament. Thank you. <laughs> President of Elytra, and we too are delighted to be joining forces with Text Publishing and with the Italian Cultural Institute um, to be welcoming Diego Marani to Melbourne. Um, Elytra is the Australian Association for Literary Translation, so we have a particular interest in um, promoting literary translation and the work of people who love language and translation. Um, by way of introduction, just let me say, oh, have I turned this on? Yes, we're on. Sorry, closer, do you think? Um, by way of introduction, just let me say, uh, Diego has dedicated his working life to languages, translation and literature. He studied at the highly regarded School for Interpreting and Translating in Trieste, which he described, I think not entirely disapprovingly, as more like a military barracks than an educational institution. <laughs> it obviously paid off, because he's worked for many years as a translator and is now a policy officer with the European Commission. The many years of study, travel and practice that he's dedicated to languages to perfecting his skills as a polyglot are described in a short book called Come ho imparato le lingue, How I Learned Languages, which I don't think has yet been translated into English. Um, but I certainly recommend it to anybody who likes some informative but entertaining advice about how to teach, learn and improve foreign language skills. It also explores the way learning a new language allows us to break through the protective shell of our own identity and take on a new one. So Diego, can you tell us a little bit about how you got hooked on languages and how you, why you decided to break out of your protective shell of Italian and of your local dialect and branch into so much more? Well, indeed, it all began with my dialect. When I was young, speaking dialect was forbidden. At school, we were punished if we spoke our dialect. And so, well, what more transgressive than speak my dialect? My grandparents used to speak my dialect, and so I learned it from them. And I immediately understood that speaking languages was, in a way, a weapon, in, in a way, an open door to something else. Speaking my dialect, I could communicate with a part of my village that was, would have been inaccessible simply with Italian. I discovered I had 
two identities. One, a proper Italian identity with my Italian, and then my true one, my deepest one, which I still very much cherish, that was expressed through my dialect. So I understood that, well, in languages you had room for exploration, and I decided that I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn true languages, uh, living languages, not the old languages I had at school, the ancient Greek and Latin, that now I miss actually, and uh, one of my plans for retirement is to study Latin and ancient Greek. <laughs> Uh, perhaps because they are silent languages. You also need this in your life. Silent languages. Uh, so it all began like that. I went to the only school in uh, Italy at that time that offered a degree in interpretation and actually I'm more uh, of an interpreter rather than a translator. Uh, I like the spoken world very much as the written one indeed because I always wrote uh, the language, the word uh, is my obsession indeed. I invented also a language so uh, you know I'm uh, some kind of a lunatic, some language free I would say. And my profession brought me to Brussels uh, to the European Union where I been a translator for a long time and still today I'm in charge with our multilingualism strategy. We uh, try to promote language learning in Europe and integration through language learning. Because if there's one thing about languages, it is that in Europe we need to share them. It is only through this that we can build uh, create a European identity. To, we, we can emphasize the common ground from which all our cultures come out. And working for the European Union, my first question, my everyday's question is, what is a European? Uh, this quest I'm still uh, following. <laughs> So this overlap between language and identity appears in a lot of your work, particularly in the two books the text is recently published in English translation, uh, which are for sale at the back, uh, New Finnish Grammar and Last of the Vostyaks. Um, as you'll have guessed from the title, if you haven't read it yet, New Finnish Grammar is a love story. <laughs> no, no, it is. <laughs> it's an ode to the Finnish language. Um, the, the main character is Sampo Karjalainen, I meant to check the pronunciation of that with uh, Diego, uh, an amnesiac soldier, soldier whose identity has been pieced together um, by others. And he devotes enormous effort to learning the Finnish language, reconstructing some kind of identity for himself um, after uh, an incident where he lost his memory. Now this is a notoriously difficult language in fact, we, we learn in the book that it has none of the linear sentences of Indo-European languages because it's not related to Indo-European languages. Uh, for example, instead of linear sentences, we have words grouped around the verb like moons around a planet. And whichever one is nearest to the verb becomes the subject. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, and, and Diego uh, uh, dedicated some time to learning Finnish, and, and it's not an easy thing to do, I'm wondering, was this book a way of processing the, the trauma, perhaps, <laughs> Of, um, of learning a language like Finnish? Well, Finnish was um, uh, some kind of sickness for me. Now I'm healed. I forgot it. <laughs> no, um, I studied Finnish because of my work. I was a translator at that time. And Finland was joining the EU. And so there was the need uh, of Finnish translators. I mean, translators that could translate Finnish into something else. Uh, I was too young at that time to refuse the uh, call of my boss that wanted me to go to Finland and learn Finnish. So I went there, but I had absolutely no interest at all in Finnish. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was one of I've always been tasting languages. I studied seriously a couple, 
and up tasted some others. Some I could understand roughly even without studying, for example, Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never had the slightest, the slightest interest in some odd language like Finnish. Mm -hmm. But when I began studying Finnish, I discovered that it was a completely different world. Yes, it was no uh, Indo-European, I knew that. But you couldn't, uh, in any possible way, find tracks of uh, anything you knew in, in that language. Uh, slowly, I became nonetheless baffled, startled by the richness and the strangeness of this language and culture. Uh, there, were, there was something deeper in the Finnish culture that I couldn't grasp at the beginning. And the Finnish language uh, does not help you in this. Uh, I began having a look at the book, at the grammar, and our teacher, our professor, explained us that in Finnish there are 15 cases. Well, I was used to my six cases of Latin and it was more than enough. <laughs> 15 cases. When you are, when a language has 15 cases, it is not a language. <laughs> it is something else, it is mathematics, it is not a language. And then all these names the Finnish language has, uh, inessivi, allativi, ablativi, abessivi, elativi, um, um, comitativi, Genitivi. Genitivi, accusativi. <laughs> and I asked, do we also have aperitivi? <laughs> Just to have a break with the case. <laughs> Finns like to drink, and I thought, well, we must have this one too. <laughs> they didn't laugh like you did. <laughs> uh, they took it very seriously that someone from Italy wanted to learn Finnish. Actually, they didn't believe I was serious. And again, when I went to Finland to present my book, they were a little suspicious, a little suspicious of an Italian knowing so much about them, perhaps too much. <laughs> what attracted me in the end uh, about Finland and of the Finnish language is that it, um, brought, it brought to surface something I was thinking about since ages. And it is this link between language and identity. We all are the language that we speak. I am Italian and I have a face like an Italian, not only because I speak with my hands, but also because to pronounce the sounds of the Italian language, I move the, the muscles in my face that are necessary for this. And so when I speak a foreign language, I move different parts of my face. I become someone else. I put a face, a, a mask on my face. But this is a, a, an enormous power one has when he speaks another language. Because you become someone else. You have a new life at your disposal. Now I'm disguised in English speaker, roughly. And God does not, cannot find me anymore. Where is Diego Barani? He was an Italian speaker. I've lost him. Now I am. Uh, uh, I have the superpowers uh, uh, of being someone else, of living one more life. And so all this is enthralling. All this is some kind of dope. Languages, in a way, uh, stone you. They bring you to uh, some other dimension. But then, yes, I was uh, explaining you this quest of the true European. I uh, uh, every day uh, do in my working life, uh, and this uh, matter of identity, this issue of the uh, of identity, uh, we we tend to associate language to identity, and in this way we close ourselves out from anything else. But it shouldn't be like that. Um, we are used to this link 
between language and identity by the fact that we all come from the history of the nation states. We belong to a nation state that was shaped around language. We have our mythology, we have our peers, and they are all one against the other in Europe. I'm, I'm talking about Europe here. This is why we call languages foreign languages. And with this foreign, we mean that we are not ready to be part of them. That even when we learn a language, we do not want to be contaminated by uh, its culture and flavor and ideas. We want to be like an explorer in the jungle and come back intact from this voyage. And this is wrong. Because when you learn something, when you have to abandon yourself to this something. You have to fall in love with what you are learning. Uh, so why don't we do that with languages? Why are we so uh, scared of language learning, ashamed of uh, making mistakes and badly pronouncing a language? Because of this trap of identity. Uh, when we understand that languages do not belong to states or academies or governments, but simply to the, the people who speak them, then we are free. We have access to a completely different dimension of language. You might think, probably not, that I'm now speaking English. I am not. I am speaking the English an Italian can speak. I am actually... Uh, corrupting your language on the inside, <laughs> destroying it on the inside, because I put into the English I'm speaking now my way of thinking, uh, my pronunciation inevitably, uh, but also I twist the meanings, the meaning of your words to fit my thought. This is a wonderful process, because in this way well, you uh, uh, definitely I'm not the Italian I used to be anymore because speak, learning languages you become someone else. But I'm also influencing slowly, uh, a little, your language and your culture. It will not be the same anymore when I will be dead. There will be some kind of Diego Marani in the English language and of all the other people that are learning your language. And this is wonderful, because this is what happened to our Latin centuries ago. So it is simply some kind of revenge I'm taking. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I prefer to wait for the next question. <laughs> That's wonderful. So you're enriching your language, our languages. Even if you tell us about your work. Your latest book to appear in English, so the other one, uh, the, the one most recently published by text is Last of the Boss Jars, a lyrical, beautiful, beautiful, thought-provoking book. Also a wonderful satire of academia, uh, especially linguistics. Um, it's about language death, um, so perhaps the other side of what process you're describing. Um, and it's, it's a tragic process, even for all its inevitability. Um, the last speaker of the Boss Jars language in the novel uh, resigns himself to the fact that there's no one left to him, for him to speak to in his language. He realises, this is a quote, no, there's no one with whom he could use the word describing something grey glimpsed vaguely running in the snow. This is an Eastern European cold wet language. Um, or the colour of the birch trees when they're coming into leaf. Or the smell of the lake as it unfreezes. Or the whistle of the wind as it blows in from the sea. All concepts that uh, his language has words for. Um, so every language, in other words, expresses important ideas for its speakers. It really encapsulates them. I'm wondering, with all the languages you speak, as well as your own dialect, are there some concepts you found that fit into that category that a language or dialect uh, encapsulates that in just a way that's unique? Yes, there are. There are things I need my dialect to tell. Um, when I speak my dialect, it is uh, in traffic jams, for example. <laughs> uh, when I'm uh, angry with my children, for example, uh, when I curse in general. 
And there are things that only my dialect can tell. For example, the kind of he, human he, we have in my place in Italy. I come from the flat country in the northeastern part of Italy. Uh, we have a word for hot, warm, humid places in, in Italian, but I need my dialect to express this. And this word is stofag. I'm not sure you all ever heard about it. And then Warm again. Already. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a whole set of these words I need my dialect <coughs> to say. But living in Brussels, I don't have many dialect speakers of my dialect around. So I'm quite like the last of the Vostiaks. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this novel of mine, I tell the story of the last speaker of a disappeared language. And I try to see what happens to a man that uh, cannot speak anymore with uh, anybody else because his language doesn't exist anymore and he speaks no other language. In all my books, actually, I conduct some kind of experiments with my characters. Uh, I have no answers for all this uh, linguistic riddle. I just explore and I'm happy with that. But talking about dead languages. Can we say a language uh, ever dies? I, I, I was telling you about Latin and ancient Greek. Can we say that Latin today is dead? In a way, yes, nobody speaks Latin anymore. But we could also say that Latin is absolutely alive to the point that it has multiplied into five or six more different new Neo-Latin languages, which are French, Spanish, Italian, and, and Catalan. So, uh, are we sure that languages die? Or, or isn't it just that one language slowly fades, disappears into another? And the, the meaning of that language are always around, because in fact, it is us, humanity, that always will, will always have some kind of language. So we must not be scared that our language will ever die, or any language will ever die. As far as, there, as long as there will be humans, we will always have the languages we need to express our feelings. And the more we know different languages, the more we will be able to understand and to express our feelings. Because when you speak a different language, you understand a different culture, you become inevitably more tolerant, and you see yourself in a different way. Uh, you, you don't remain the same, you change, and always for the better. Not because in other languages other languages are better than yours, but simply because this multilingualism opens your eyes. I am profoundly Italian, and I'm deeply uh, attached to my country and to my small village. I speak my dialect even better than many of my uh, friends uh, uh, back in Italy. But when I go back to my local pub, they are a little scared, afraid of me. They call me the Swiss. <laughs> because they feel I'm not, I'm not like them anymore. I know too many things. I've seen too many different things. They, I don't laugh at their jokes, and they don't laugh at mine. <laughs> there's something wrong going on there. Uh, Despite the fact that they respect me a lot, because I still speak perfect dialect better than them, uh, but nonetheless I have changed. Uh, I have not become a Belgian, though I live in Belgium, not a Frenchman, not an Englishman, not a European. What I am? I am the same old Diego Marami, but corrupted by <laughs> this language knowledge I developed like uh, some kind, I told you, of mental illness. <laughs> now, you worked as, for many years as a translator. I'm wondering what it's like to now be on the other side of this process. What is it, what is it like to be translated? 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad to be translated because only through translation I can be understood in other languages. And I very much appreciate and respect the work of translators because translating is not just taking words from one language and putting, it, putting them into another one. It is transposing a whole uh, story, a whole universe from one language into another. And so uh, uh, recreate in that other language um, the same points of reference that the story had in its original. And this is a very delicate operation. Um, I always offer my translators my uh, complete cooperation and help when they are translating my books. And I uh, never give judgments or uh, try to influence their choice. I'm aware that for some languages they have to change the story in order to make it fit into their own language. And this I find is absolutely legitimate because uh, the translation is a recreation of the book. It is another book actually, translating is a creative process that I consider um, absolutely crucial for uh, intercultural dialogue. Wonderful. It's good for all the translators to hear. <laughs> uh, for the Italian speakers, I thought I'd tell you about Diego's latest book, which uh, is Il Cane di Dio. Now that hasn't come out yet in English, has it? Not yet. No, it's very new. Um, and those of you who, who speak Italian might like to go out and read this one. It's a giallo, or crime novel, so a little bit different from the ones we've heard about so far. It's set not too far into the future, in the fifth year of the reign of Benedict XVIII, when Italy is ruled by Vatican dictatorship, inspired in large part by the teachings of Benedict XVI, the uh, recent one. And the detective in the novel works for the regime, ensuring its laws are obeyed by the populace. Uh, but it soon turns out that he doesn't actually have the church hierarchy on his side after all, and he's in a bit of danger. I won't reveal anything more, because I want you to go out and read it, except to say that even here language is a theme, because one character studies the brain of a captive chimpanzee and discovers it can speak Swahili. <laughs> a finding that dangerously calls into question all sorts of church teachings on the soul. Uh, now, I couldn't help noticing that the tagline on the front cover says, The first adventure of Domingo Salazar, detective in the service of God. Are there going to be more Domingo Salazar novels to come? There's another one ready, but you know, publishing a book like that in Italy is looking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, yes, it went well, fair enough, but not what uh, I imagined. And so I'm waiting for the English edition, and I'm sure that the English-speaking uh, readers will be more open-minded. My character is... Um, perhaps a very fictional one, but it is not so far away from what really could happen in Italy if we stick to the Catholic rule and if we adopted the Catholic Church rules for our society. Uh, it is just a step down and you are into some kind of theocracy like Iran. Uh, I had a glimpse, uh, for the first time I never did since I was a child, to the Catholic Church uh, catechism, and I discovered awful things, for example, that they allow the death penalty. So this inspired me, and I uh, thought, invented, created this uh, character that is no Dan Brown character, it is something completely different, more profound, and well, uh, another uh, story, and inevitably, as I am a language freak, there had to be a language involved in the plot. <laughs> Wonderful. So we can look forward to the next one. Now, not content with the many real living languages that you speak, or writing about an imaginary, inventing and writing about an imaginary dead language, Bostiak, um, and about primates learning Swahili and other languages, you've also invented a language of your own, Europanto or Europanto. I'm not sure how you pronounce it in Europanto, you'll have to tell us. Um, this is a comical but very 